Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church on this Reformation Sunday. It is a pleasure to have you here with us this morning. I'm Pastor Fritz Fowler, and I serve as the lead pastor here at Trinity. And welcome to everyone here on this beautiful Sunday morning. A special welcome to those of you who are joining us uh, through social media and on the radio at Word FM, where you can find us every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. at 97.1 Great Songs of the Faith. We're we're honored to have you here with us. For those who are new to our community or joining us for the first time, uh, we invite you to submit a connection card. We'd love to know that you're here and that you're visiting with us. You can do that one of two ways. For those on our sanctuary, there are connection cards that you can fill out in the pew cards in front of you or in the transepts underneath you or right in front of you. For those of you uh, who prefer to do it electronically, There is a QR code on page one of the bulletin that you can scan with your mobile phone this morning. For those of you joining us online, if you head to our website, trinitylansdale.com, trinitylansdale.com, scroll to the bottom of the home page. You'll see whether it says uh, bulletins and uh, uh, the weekly. You can follow along today with our worship service. We will be celebrating the Holy Sacrament this morning, and so if you are joining us at home, uh, we invite you to have your communion elements, bread, wine, grape juice, uh, with you this morning so you can fully celebrate with us. Montgomery County, the county which Trinity resides, is, continues to be in the high-risk category, so we ask that everyone in our sanctuary to keep your mask on, covering your nose and your mouth throughout the worship service. If you need a mask, We have some available for you in the lobby this morning. If you're looking to use the restroom, if you take either hallway uh, to the lobby, turn left, you'll find a men's room and a women's room on your left, a little bit further past the parlor, and on your right is a gender-neutral bathroom. All three of the bathrooms are ADA accessible and have baby changing rooms in them this morning. In addition to it being Reformation Sunday, it is my honor and privilege to welcome the Reverend Dr. Guy Irwin. Dr. Irwin serves as the president of United Lutheran Seminary, uh, located here in Philadelphia and in Gettysburg. I met Reverend Dr. Irwin back in 2013 at a conference in Bishop's Ranch, California. A little bit later in 2013, he was elected as the bishop of the Southwest California Synod, where he served for a number of years before he was called to serve as the president of United Lutheran Seminary in 2020. And so it is a pleasure to have him here uh, serving as our preacher this morning. Uh, and, th- and, and some of you attended his talk on Reformation artwork in Heisen Hall right before the service. And so following the worship service, please introduce yourself uh, and, and say hello and to greet Dr. Irwin this morning. It is my pleasure now to invite forward uh, Bill Grave, who is going to share with us our mission moment uh, this morning. Good morning. Over the next three weeks, you will hear from members of Trinity's generosity team, providing additional details about our congregation's upcoming pledge program. Is generosity another word for stewardship? It certainly is. The book of Genesis provides perspective on stewardship and generosity. God creates us in the divine image and puts us in charge of his creation. All of what we have is entrusted to us by God. We are stewards, caretakers, and managers, having been granted a high degree of autonomy, but also responsibility. Our task as stewards brings a sacred trust and a solemn duty. We carry it out in everything we say, think, and do after we say, I believe. St. Paul tells us that God is able to provide us with every blessing in abundance so that we may share abundantly in every good work. Our dear Trinity has been blessed for 139 years. As we approach our annual pledge weekend, please prayerfully consider these biblical perspectives on faithful stewardship. And please reach out to any of us on the generosity team with questions or comments. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Bill. People of God, I invite you to stand as you are able as we begin our worship service with confession and forgiveness found on page two of your bulletin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our way to the way of justice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our pristine and gracious God. Listen. People of God, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the grace in Jesus Christ, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. Let us sing together, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray together. Gracious Father, as we hear from God's Word. A reading from Romans, the third chapter. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds ascribed by the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then by what becomes of boasting it is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. like to share with you a story from the gospel as found in John the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. So Jesus had been talking to the Jews, and there were some Jews who followed Jesus. And he said to them, if you continue in my ways, you will become my disciples. And, they, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now they said to him, we are descendants of Abraham, and we have never been slaves to anything. What do you mean when you say, we will be free? And Jesus replied to them, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. And a slave has no permanent place at the household's table. But the son is there forever. So if the son makes you free, you are free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Thank you so much, Alan and Dave, for speaking God's word to us this morning. I'd like to invite forward the children to come forward here for our children's sermon. I need my iPad because there's something on it. Come on up, guys. We'll sit right here in the front here. Good morning. Good morning. 
And for those of you at home, you can come a little bit closer. And where's Pastor Julie? Would you get, would you get us our treat? Thank you, Pastor Julie. Good morning, guys. How are you this morning? Good to see you. Thanks for coming up this morning and being here. Do you know what today is? Halloween. Halloween. It's Halloween. That's right. That's right. And we have a special treat for you because it is Halloween. Are you going to go trick-or-treating tonight? Yeah. But we have a party. Too. You have a party too? We get to go roller skating. You're roller skating? You have a birthday party? It's a birthday party. Awesome. Okay. It's good, good, good. Well, tonight at the pastor's house, we're going to be handing out candy too. So if you come by the pastor's house tonight, we're going to be giving away some candy tonight with my, my husband and I. We'll be outside and we're hoping to get some folks. So uh, 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 before we get to the 95 Reese's though, I want to tell you about what else it is today. Today is Reformation Sunday and it is the anniversary of when we remember that Martin Luther, this guy here, that's a picture of him when he was younger. Huh? Martin Luther King. Not Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King was here in America. Mar this Martin Luther, they share a name, uh, is from Germany. He was a German. He was a German monk who in 1517 nailed a sheet of paper to the church doors. That's what the story is. That was the way, that was like the bulletin board. You know how we have Facebook, right? In Martin Luther's day, you would nail what you wanted people to know to the door to the church doors and that's what Martin Luther did he had 95 statements of concern he wanted to start a conversation and that kind of started the reformation and so and so it was like a love letter to the church Martin Luther was writing to the church to say hey I think we might be making a few mistakes here and I want to want to help the church out here and start a conversation Well, we'll get to that in a second, okay? Okay? But at our first service this morning, we also buried a time capsule. We, we and it, you can go outside and see the hole. Your parents can take you and see, you the, see the hole today. And the time capsule, I think, is sitting out there. Uh, and we're going to be burying this time capsule as a part of our gift to the next generation of Christians. And I thought it'd be really cool if I read you the letter that I wrote to the Church of Trinity when they unseal it, when they resurrect and they dig up the time capsule. Yeah. Can I share that with you? Yeah. Okay. So here's the letter I wrote. It's not very long, but it says, October 31st, 2021. When's that? This year. That's today. Yeah. That's today. That's right. Dear Trinity family and partners in ministry of 2032, greetings in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, we are celebrating Reformation Sunday at Trinity as a part of our celebration and looking forward to how the Holy Spirit is guiding us. We place this time capsule into the ground during the sending portion of our liturgy. This time capsule contains mementos from the last 19 months of the COVID-19 pandemic. Included are bulletins from special services, newsletters, newspapers, and much more that we hope to inspire you to see how the Holy Spirit was at work in and through our church community during the devastating days of the COVID-19 pandemic. We hope that you feel encouraged, no matter the challenges that you face in 2032, to remember that God, who claimed you in the waters of baptism, is guiding you through the challenges of your present days. We intended, when we buried this time capsule in 2021, that it will be sealed in the ground for 11 years, to be resurrected on Easter Sunday, 2032, and that each generation will bury a time capsule as a gift to the next generation to remind them of God's steadfast love and faithfulness to our Trinity community. 2032 will be Trinity's 150th anniversary. That'll be our birthday. We'll be 150 years old serving in the Lansdale community. And then I wrote the prayer that we prayed at our first liturgy, and then I ended it this way. Blessings to you, dear church. Know that we were praying for you 11 years ago and praying that together, throughout generations, 
Trinity will continue to share God's love and proclaim the risen Christ to Lansdale and beyond. Your partner in the gospel, Pastor Fritz. And so that's the letter that we put in that sealed time capsule. And so we put some hand sanitizer and we put face masks and we even put a roll of toilet paper to, because that helped us all get through the pandemic. Not that we did it perfectly, right? We, this, this has been hard on all of us. We put toilet paper in there because that was the number one item that people bought during the pandemic. And we put a little note on the toilet paper to say, we don't know what challenges you're facing now, but just in case, here's a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> okay? So that's, that's what it was, right? Martin Luther, Martin Luther, 500 plus years ago, started, started the Reformation. We're bringing us back that it's all about God's grace. And that's what we're hoping to do, that on the 150th anniversary of Trinity, in 2032, you guys will be 11 years older. How old are you right now? Nine. nine. You'll be 20 years old. You'll be 20 years old if you're nine years old right now, right? And that you'll be able to open up that time capsule and to say, you know what? Trinity tried the best that she could to get through this pandemic. And there's good parts and there was bad parts and there was tough parts. But through it all, God was with us. God has been with the church the last 500 plus years. God's going to be with the church in the future. That's what I remember today. No matter what happens in your life, God is with you. Okay? Okay. Let's bow our heads and fold our hands, and the congregation is going to help us out here. Dear Jesus, thank you for your steadfast love. Help us to stay focused on you. Amen. Okay. And now as a treat, you can help yourself to one, of the th to one of the Reese's right here. So if you guys want to take a piece of candy, you can take it back with you. You can take two, and you can give one to your brother. If you have another sibling who didn't come up, there you go. Now you know why there's not 95, because the kids this morning also helped out. Oh, that's very nice of you. And have a great Reformation Sunday and Halloween. Okay. You're welcome. You're welcome. Dr. Irwin, we still have quite a few here to, to enjoy later, later this afternoon. So. Yes, yeah, save one for me. Grace to you and peace from God, our Creator, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm grateful for the invitation to be with you this morning. The uh, relationship between this congregation and our seminary, United Luther Seminary, is strong and old, and I bring you the greetings and the gratitude of our students, faculty, and staff. Especially with the Philadelphia campus, you have a long association. And in fact, the last time I was here in this sanctuary was to preach at the closing commencement service for the Philadelphia Seminary on its last commencement as an independent seminary before the consolidation of the two began. I had no idea then that I would end up back here in this role, but I'm grateful to God for leading us to this day and looking forward to all that lies ahead. In this gospel lesson, Jesus is speaking to people who were clinging to an old way of understanding their relationship with God and at the same time were wrestling with a new one. The old view was that to be in the group that defined itself as descendants of Abraham was sufficient for God's favor. The new understanding was that Jesus himself represented God in a new and more direct way, and that faith in this new understanding of God as revealed in Jesus was what God desired of the people instead. We use this text to remember the Reformation because Martin Luther presented a new and liberating truth in his own time 500 years ago. Back then, the old idea was the notion that the human church was the gatekeeper of heaven, was the exclusive dispenser of mercy and grace, and the sole protector of God's promise. And the new idea, although it wasn't new, that motivated Luther so strongly and set him free was that the individual believer's trust in Christ alone was sufficient to draw one close to God 
and to secure the blessings of God's favor. Because I've spent my life in the study of Martin Luther and the Reformation, I get to preach on this text every Reformation Day. And every year I hear these words a little differently. I can look back at my old sermons and see exactly what was happening that year because it always connects to this text. I ask myself, what is happening right now? What am I caught up in right now for which I need the truth to set me free? What is it that holds me back today from fully embracing the freedom that Jesus has to offer? This year is a little harder than some because there's so much going on. There's so much that it's hard to single one thing out. We have the ongoing pandemic to deal with, the erosion of democracy in the face of authoritarianism at home and abroad, the unfettered predator capitalism that dominates global trade and finance, and of course, the destruction of the natural environment and the poisoning of the air, water, and land. Any one of these problems would make us anxious by itself, but now we have them all at once, and in fact, they're intertwined. What kind of truth can Jesus offer us that can free us from the painful truths around us? That's my question this year. What new reality can help us cope with the painful earthly realities we see all around us of destruction and injustice and greed, all the things that we humans have created for ourselves? What is our role in all of this? There's no real easy answer. So I think back to these people in the story who are having trouble understanding Jesus. What is this truth that Jesus is speaking of? It's not, clearly it is not a truth that it's easy for them to hear because it counters their expectations about where truth comes from and how truth gets communicated. For them, the main truth about God was that they belonged to God through their birth, through their ancestry. Today, we might call that ethnicity or identity. The people in this story belong to God because their ancestors did. I get that. I claim as one of my identities, being an Osage Indian, I'm a citizen of that nation based on who my family has always been. And that identity is real for me. It's a truth that I feel in my bones and it is as much a part of me as the land on which my family has always lived for as many generations as anyone can know. But Jesus is showing us a different truth, a new kind of truth and a new kind of identity based on an even deeper way of understanding ourselves, in an identity rooted in our basic humanity. The fact that we have all been created by a single creator. All the smaller identities of race and tribe and nation, though each is in its own way real and might even be important to us, all of these are minor in comparison with our greater, more basic common humanity. And this is the core truth of human life, that we are all fragile, we are all mortal, we are all afraid of things we can't control, and above all, we're all in this together. The truth of which Jesus speaks is that we are the ones to whom God is looking for action. Jesus hopes to set us free from fear to work together for the good of all and for the good of all creation. But sin and selfishness in our world have caused us to turn the idea of truth in itself into a tool for human advantage. We make propositional truth claims about external realities and even about other humans and their motivations sometimes so that we can make sense of a confusing world 
and can protect ourselves from chaos and disorder. Because I think in some ways we can't handle the truth of the dangerous world that we have created for ourselves. And so we construct stories of causality and we blame and we point fingers because we don't know what to do. We put our faith in those who seem to know but who are often just the loudest voices and not the wisest. And truth becomes opinion. But that kind of truth is a truth that traps us, not one that sets us free. But there's where we live, in this world of competing and highly contested truths, where truth can be equated with a personal wish, and one can wall oneself up in a private castle built of personal truths, impregnable to outside ideas, a world where reality is whatever we want it to be without having to make room for uncertainty or the possibility of changing one's mind. I have come to believe that the opposite of truth is not error or falsehood, but stubbornness and pride, refusing to even consider another point of view or the chance that we might actually be wrong. Martin Luther understood this, I think, better long ago than we do now. We look back on the Reformation as something that was heroic, that was done once by brave people and was over long ago. A time in which Luther spoke a mighty word and the world and the church just changed. But it wasn't really like that. Change is really, really hard. It took a whole century of conflict and even outright war to ensure that Luther's reforms would survive. And by the end of his life, Luther was fairly convinced that things were actually going so badly that the world might be coming to an end. Luther had reason, he thought, to be even less optimistic about the world and his fellow human beings than we are. He believed that the world was in the very grip of the devil, the father of lies, who had twisted human hearts with fear and greed. And the biggest lie of all for Luther was that some human beings were better than others, closer to God, and held the power of salvation over others. They spoke directly for God, they thought, specifically that the church, through its penitential system and its power to forgive, literally held the keys to heaven in human hands to be used for human ends, and worst of all, for human gain. So Luther spoke out against this and then doubled down and defended what he saw as Jesus' truth against a whole world's anger and skepticism. But the truth survived. Jesus' truth. A truth that we need to hear as much now as back then. The truth that we heard from the third chapter of Romans. The truth that God works apart from us. Outside of us. Even without us. God works in these ways to show us that God loves us and is with us. What is more, Jesus shows this truth to us, not just in his words, but in his very person, in his life and in his death. Jesus shows us a truth that is both infinitely distant and yet intimately present for us because he shows us this in a human body, a body like ours with hands that could touch hurting people with tenderness and healing, but also a body that could be tortured and injured and killed. It has always been the most challenging thing about Christianity that as much as we want it to, it doesn't give us simple answers to complex questions. It's not about just being part of a group or obeying everything written in a book. 
but about seeing the things around us as being all parts of what God has made and then taking the responsibility to care for Jesus' truth in God's world. The truth of Jesus is that we are called to find God not in some faraway abstraction, but in our world around us and especially in each other. Jesus is the truth that passes all our rational understanding, but at the same time is as simple as a splash of water. Jesus is the truth far too big to comprehend, but the truth that comes to us in a, a crumb of bread and a drop of wine. Jesus is the truth that is in us when we know, not as scholars know, but as children know, that we belong to God and that nothing can separate us from God's love, that love that we experience in one another, but which ultimately begins with God. So this is the freedom that Jesus promises, to give us courage, to break down the walls our fears have built around us, the fear of not being enough, the fear of failure, the fear of other people different from ourselves, or even the fear of being different ourselves. And especially, Jesus frees us from the fear of not being loved. For Jesus came into our midst as a human just like us to show us that God loves us simply because we are God's creation, made in God's image, God's very children. This is the truth Jesus offers, the truth that frees us and that we, right here and right now, badly need to hear again. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing together, by grace you have been saved.
Amen. Set free from sin and death and nourished by the word of truth, we join in prayer for all of God's creation. <clears throat> we pray for all who are longing for the word of truth and for the radical grace that flows from the cross. Inspire congregations to freely and boldly proclaim your love for all people with persistence and with hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for your creation, for mountains and rivers, streams, cities, homesteads and neighborhoods. Write in our hearts a new love and care for creation. Give us the will to curb wasteful habits and to hold accountable those who neglect the vulnerable. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all those who aspire for public office and for all those who we will vote for on Tuesday at local polling places. Pour wisdom and justice and understanding upon all who govern so that, so that the Lord in you, I'm sorry, so that they govern in communities of justice and peace and that may thrive in this world. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all who long for healing in mind and body and spirit, especially those who are on our prayer list. Strengthen hospitals, clinics, counseling centers, nursing homes and recovery centers, that they may be holy spaces of renewal, that all might live the abundant life that you intended. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who seek, seek to grow in faith and love of you. Guide teaching and learning in confirmation, in small groups, Sunday school, youth groups, schools, seminaries, and universities. Lord, in your mercy, we give you thanks for all the saints and reformers who have gone before us, who dwell in your holy habitation. Give us courage through their example to challenge unjust systems and to work toward life-giving reformation. Lord, in your mercy, confident that you hear us, O God, we boldly place our prayers into your hands through Jesus Christ, our truth and life. Amen. Amen. In just a moment, our Trinity Choir is going to come forward to sing about how God is our refuge and our strength. And during that time is the time where we would normally take up our offering. But we recognize the COVID-19 pandemic keeps us still away from one another and all of our rituals and our liturgy. And so there is offering baskets here. Uh, in, in, on the altar rail that if you brought a gift with you today, you can place your offering into. If you would like to give electronically, uh, you can head to our website, trinitylandsdale.com, or there is a QR code uh, in your bulletin that you can scan that will take you to our giving page. Thank you for your gifts and for your offerings. It's, it's because of our investment, it's because of our sharing of our, of our ties with God that we can ensure that our ministry continues, that Trinity will be here in 11 years as we celebrate 150 years of God's grace, of God's love, of, of God's mission for the Lansdale community. So thank you. As we move towards our peace at this time, uh, I want to share with you a couple of different ways that you can share the peace with one another. The first of those is simply by saying, the peace of Christ be with you and looking one another in the eyes. Another way might be an elbow bump or a fist bump or in American Sign Language, the peace be with you is two words that become calm in American Sign Language, and that is become calm, become calm. And so, people of God, the peace of Christ be with you all. Let us share that peace with one another as our choir comes forward.
Amen. If you're joining us from home, I now invite you to have your communion elements in front of you at this time. Here in the sanctuary, we will be communing by each transept first. You'll be invited to come forward uh, with your hand stretched out flat. I will place a wafer into your hand. You're then invited to pick that wafer up and dip it into the cup of wine, and then to step far to the sides of the altar rail and to consume both elements. Please keep your mask on covering your nose and mouth until you are ready to receive and you are physically distanced from other folks. You're then invited to kneel at the altar in reflection and prayer or to return to your seats. If you prefer gluten-free wafers, grape juice, or sterile packets that contain both the body and blood of Jesus, they can be found on the brown tables in front of the monastery rail here at the front of the church. On each pillar is a bowl for you to place your cup into so that way we can wash it and recycle it 
following this morning's liturgy. Let us now continue with Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join the unending hymn. Holy, holy Lord, God of the power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Lord God, we praise you, bless you, and adore you. In thanksgiving, we bow before you, O loving Father. You have created all, and you care for your children day and night. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You sent your Son to bring us your salvation. Christ is the source of every grace and blessing, the true Paschal Lamb and the bread of heaven, the very joy of all, the Son that warms and lights us. Hallelujah. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup and gave thanks. He poured and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the blood of my covenant, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We remember Jesus, your word made flesh, our elder brother dying on the accursed tree, crushing the power of hell and ri rising again victorious in the grave. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! Send your spirit on this holy feast. Nourish and heal us with the body and blood of our Savior. Bestow on your church your sweetest love, your transcendent comfort, your unity and peace. Hallelujah! To you, the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give our thanks and praise, joining now and forever in loud songs of hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our All who hunger and thirst come. The table is now ready. Thanks be to God. The assembly is invited to be seated. For those of you who are not physically able to be with us here at Trinity at this time, I invite you to take your bread and your wine or juice and to, and to commune each other with the words, the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. If you are alone this morning, know that we are joined together by one God, one faith, one baptism. And so to say aloud to yourself the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. For those of you here in our sanctuary, this is not our table. It is not the Lutheran Church's table. It is God's table. And so all are welcome. All of God's children are welcome to come forward and receive Holy Communion. If you prefer, however, to receive a blessing, let myself or Dr. Irwin know, oh, we'll be, we'll be honored to speak a word of blessing over you this day. We continue with singing the Lamb of God.
The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you, preserve you, and keep you to life everlasting. Live in God's forgiveness. Dwell in peace now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love in Jesus Christ our Savior, and our Lord. Amen. Thank you again for joining us for worship on this Reformation Sunday. Uh, we hope that you have felt God's love today and that you leave here inspired, uh, knowing that God is continuing to do a new thing in the church, continuing to do a new thing in the world. And we're just a part of the story. We're just one, one bit of the larger story that God is at work in this narrative arc of God's re redeeming the world to God's self. And so thank you for being here this morning. Thank you, Dr. Irwin, for sharing uh, God's word with us this morning, serving as our preacher. Uh, blessings to you and on United Lutheran Seminary. Uh, I graduated from one of the predecessor bodies of United Lutheran Seminary, and so I have an invested interest in the seminary. So does Trinity. 
I hope most of you know that we have four students currently uh, from Trinity Lutheran that are, uh, three of them are at United Lutheran Seminary and one of them at our sister seminaries. And we have a f- couple of folks who are continuing to discern uh, their call and are in college right now and uh, thinking about seminary. And so we continue to pray for all of our seminaries and for our seminarians and uh, for those preparing for ministry. Next Sunday is All Saints Sunday. Uh, You are invited either during this week or on Sunday morning to bring a photo of your loved one if you would like to have it added to our displays that will be around in the transepts and in the windows. Uh, We will uh, be be, be marking All Saints Sunday next week. And so following uh, our Sunday morning liturgy, in the afternoon will be the columbarium walk. here in our columbarium. All that details for that can be found in the weekly or on our website. Tomorrow night is feast, our community meal from 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, and uh, uh, all the other news and announcements are in your weekly or can be found on our website, trinitylandsale.com. People of God, I invite you to stand as you are able, as you are sent out with God's blessing. You are Christ's body, bringing new life in a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen. Let us sing together. Rise, shine, you people. Now as you leave this place, go in peace. The living word dwells within you. Thanks be to God. You're welcome.